Costa is brought to you by FQM Trident Limited, a subsidiary of First Quantum Minerals Limited. Welcome to Costa. Now, President Haga in the Hichilama recently declared the ongoing prolonged dry spell in the nation a national disaster. This declaration follows a comprehensive assessment by the government which highlighted significant damage to crops, livestock and water sources countrywide. In response to this crisis, the president has unveiled a series of measures aimed at providing immediate relief to affected communities. Additionally, he emphasized the necessity of implementing sustainable solutions in mitigating future impacts, including the promotion of sustainable agriculture, water harvesting, and conservation practices. Did the country, through the Meteorological Department, foresee this problem? If we did, how prepared were we to address these drought conditions? Climate change is a thorny issue and is the big global elephant in the room. People beginning to see unfamiliar weather patterns where it gets dry when it's supposed to rain and rains when it's supposed to be dry. We discuss this right after this break. <clears throat> My name is Costa Monsa. This is Costa. Joining us tonight on DSTV, it's channel 271. Go TV, it's channel 20. Via Facebook, we're live on Diamond TV Zambia. That as well is on YouTube. My guest is Minister of Green Economy and Environment, Member of Parliament, Honorable Collins Nzovu. He joins me on Costa this evening. Minister, it's a pleasure to host you and uh, welcome to the program. Always a pleasure to be here at Diamond TV and I hope we'll have a constructive discussion. Thank you so much. I think. The best way to start this discussion really is from your own definition or explanation as Minister in Charge of the Environment and the Green Economy. What would you be telling the citizen tonight in terms of especially those that have not been using any scientific methods but just people who've lived doing peasant or horticultural farming knowing that somewhere between October and March, it will rain, so we need to start early planting and so on. And now the cycles have changed, and they've been able to practice this type of farming for years uh, immemorial. And now to be told there's climate change and weather patterns have changed. What is climate change? Um, thank you so much for having me here. And um, I hope, as I said already, we'll have a constructive discussion. What's climate change? You say climate which has changed, mm -hmm. change in weather conditions, um, temperatures have increased, the rainfall patterns have changed, and all of this has come uh, about because of uh, the need to develop, and development is basically anchored on uh, the utilization of energy. So industrialized countries burned these fossil fuels core to produce energy for their development, for basically to power the, the various industries. That's where we, this, this is where we are. And now, um, when you ask me how are people normally <coughs> going to carry on their business, particularly those, say, in the agriculture sector, it's an opportunity for me to encourage Zambians, obviously, to listen to us in, in the Ministry of Green Economy and Environment, and particularly the, our meteorological department. Remember us coming into office, we said that uh, we'll put a premium 
and science and technology. And uh, prediction of weather conditions by meteorological department has been very well supported by government. One of the things we've done at that uh, institution is to ensure that we automate some of the stations we have. First of all, increase the numbers, because remember, this is a science which is dependent on what God gives us. So we need to have a lot of stations spread throughout the country, as many as possible. So just this uh, last two years, um, we've installed automated stations in all provincial centers. We have uh, trained, uh, uh, in fact, we've employed very qualified meteorological staff. What are the results we are seeing? I think the results are very, very good. Our predictive capacity has increased. If you remember, Costa, <coughs> every year in about September, November, I go to Parliament, in fact, September, I go to Parliament to issue what's called a seasonal forecast. A seasonal forecast will tell you basically how the season will span out, how much rainfall you will receive in that hydrological year. Uh, so this year, or last season, 2023, 2024, we predicted the normal to below normal rainfall. And if you noticed over the times, we we're giving a lot of advisories, monthly, weekly. And all of these pointed, obviously, to the fact that uh, this year will be a difficult year. Mm. But, what Minister, was, what, what, one would argue when you say you've ramped up preparedness in the Met Department, you've supported them, and you went out to give a signal of a normal to below normal rainfall. This does not correspond with your mitigative measures because it clearly looks like you as government have been caught unaware, or if you knew you've been caught pants down, about this drought spell. Not at all. Actually, to the contrary. We even went further. Um, we trained agriculture extension officers. We went to do advisories on radio and TV. We even went further and interpreted the meteorological data, the focus, the advisories in local languages. All radio stations, community radio stations, were broadcasting this. Further, um, we worked very, very closely with the Ministry of Agriculture ourselves, interpreting this data, talking to farmers. We engaged the Zambian National Farmers Union, the small-scale farmers, everybody. And I'll tell you... What, were you, te what were you telling the farmers? We are telling the farmers when to plant, what variety to plant, when to weed, when to fertilize. And I can tell you, Costa, that had we not done that, I think the, the yields this year would even have been lower than... But, but why were you telling the farmers to plant when you knew that there would be no rain? which is called climate smart agriculture, we still need to eat, remember. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the most of what we have. If we have little rainfall, we still need to produce food for the 20 million Zambians. What we're emphasizing on, and what I'm going to emphasize on in, on, uh, in the coming years, was that uh, now, in the advent of climate change now, we need to be serious with what's called climate smart agriculture. That's which the is? reason. Which is? Which is ensuring that uh, we use meteorological data in our agriculture purposes. I'll tell you, and I'll tell you that this works a lot. If you look at uh, commercial farmers, obviously, who value meteorological data much more, productivity per hectare has increased because, and I'm talking about uh, them using rain-fed, uh, um, uh, 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 using the rains to, uh, to produce their food to produce a food, obviously, not only for themselves, but mainly, obviously, for, for, for sale. We need to, have, to be climate smart in all areas, and this is the only way we increase productivity. Mm. Minister, I, I'll still argue further that uh, I, I disagree with you tonight that government was well prepared and that you put in place mitigative measures. Starting from His Excellency, when he declared this a national disaster, he said, and I quote, what do I tell those people, the ladies that I encouraged to plant, and now there's no rain. I've seen you in helicopters. I've seen you in, in planes flying over, especially in your constituency, one of the hard-hit you know, areas, barely checking on failing crop. So if we knew that there would not be enough rainfall, did we advise the farmers to either maybe plant later, because now we are seeing rain this time around where it's, when it's unusual? Did we provide the farmers maybe with drought-resistant seed? What, what we see government responding to is failure 
of crop and not the preparation aspect. I think you are missing the point. There are two aspects. There's one when you are responding to the rains you are receiving. In the beginning, when you are planting, when, is a cro there, when there's crop <coughs> development, in the beginning, obviously, um, when uh, at the time of planting, we, we, have, we had relatively good rains. The reason uh, President Yaka and H. Lehman declared the, the, the disaster and emergence was in the aftermath, post planting. Because. So, what remember, was, the, what was remember, the data showing us then, uh, Minister? What the data was showing us, obviously, was that we would have uh, a drought. But that drought was more severe. Remember also his explanation on uh, the timing. February, we received very, very little for rainfall. And you know that in February is a time when our maize is about to tassel. Uh, it's a critical time for development of the crop. And unfortunately, that's a, a, that's a time which hit us and hit us very, very badly. So, so, if, the data, so very is, if the data was showing us that we would experience some drought, if that's what the data was showing, what did your ministry and the other line ministries like agriculture and energy do? Because even up to now, farmers, most of them who had their maize, like you said, at the level uh, th that is just about to start you know, fruiting or, or ripening, have not been assisted at all. I'll tell you, as again, some of the measures basically we did later on, because people had already planted, remember. The maize, basically it's a maize, had developed. The only thing we would do then in the midst of uh, this severe drought was advisories. For example, for small-scale farmers, we encouraged them to do mulching, to preserve the little moisture which was there. I think one of the, that's one of the measures we did. However, in a time like this, or in most areas where we basically depend on rain, uh, um, uh, rainfall, and it doesn't rain, it becomes a very, very difficult situation. Because at that time, the, as I said already, the maize was about to tassel. Very advanced in its development. Inevitably, it died. What have we done now? The president declared a, a disaster and emergency. And obviously, our main function now, our main core, is to ensure that our people do not go hungry. We need to provide food for them. And government will provide food for them. Uh, again, it, it, it begs what, what I'm asking. If we had foreseen this, I, I'm not hearing any tangible, practical measures that were there to save the crop, to save the livestock. You've, you've, you, you said it yourself. That's the second phase now. Mm. What you are seeing me doing going around is to first of all discourage our people from setting fire to the grass. Because right now, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a cattle person. In, that, in the last two months, I would say the livestock sector in my constituents has collapsed. Animals we used to sell for 8,000 kwacha, 9,000 kwacha. We are selling them for 4,000 kwacha, 5,000 kwacha. Obviously, my people were offloading this um, ghetto for them to find food. Okay? Now, in those flats where people take the animals, again, because of the severity of the drought, the grasslands are dry. So people, fishermen, you know, and mainly this is the, where the fishing camps are, they were setting lie to this, this grass for them to, I hear, access some fish, okay? So we're discouraging them from destroying the grasslands. Why? Most of the people, if not all the people now in the upper land, will bring the animals for grazing near the swamps. Mm. Most of the people will bring the animals also for water. So that's one clear measure. Mm. which we did, because so we need to re res uh, preserve our animals. Our animals not just for food, but for draft power. We are already looking to the next season. How do we prepare for the next season? This season is a hard one, and we must admit it's a hard one. There's a severe drought. These are the good Lord, whatever he gives you, he gives you. You need to do the most out of it. Mm. So what we are, the gear we are in now is basically to ensure that he, our people do not go hungry. As we prepare for the next season, we need to preserve those animals. So you've been around, Minister, and uh, I mean, assessing 
the extent of this, you know, drought. Uh, but but the, the, the interesting aspect also is that uh, when you geographically divide the country's map, it's like the northern part of the country um, is having more than normal rainfall. And in, 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 uh, probably this season it hasn't happened. We saw it last year, especially most parts of Uapula were terribly affected with floods. But we, we, we've had um, more than normal rainfall in the northern parts. And then it's when you come down to central Osaka, going down to the southern is where it's mostly affected. And again, the paradoxical aspect is these blocks that are affected with drought are the most producing when it comes to maize and agriculture. And on the other side, it's not the situation. Then the question is, from your assessment, what are your projected effects of this situation? And can you confidently tell the country this evening that we are going to be food secure? 100% food secure. In fact, maybe I even forgot to say a lot of other things we've done. We have stock. Any deficits we're going to um, uh, import. Already, I think we've talked to Tanzania. It's on standby. Already, I'll tell you that ZNS, the Defense Forces, ZNS Correction Services, soon in the next two months, you will, will have about 300,000 tons on board from what it, uh, the winter means. Already, right now, we've gone into higher gear to water harvest. This is very, very important. Remember, President Haka and HLM has really been singing the song of water harvesting. In my constituents, I've done a dam. That dam already is providing water for the cattle, but more so in the, in the next rain season, we believe that we'll have two crops per year. Yeah. These I'll are be, practical I'm measures. I'm very interested, I'm very interested in the water harvesting, and, and we'll come to that. Let's tackle one important aspect you've mentioned here. You, you, you say you're confident because we have enough, enough stock in reserve? For the, for, for, for the maize crop. How much, Minister, do we have in reserve? Because uh, what we, we read, and from the ministerial statement on the floor of Parliament by your colleague, Honorable Mtolo Piri, is the recklessness of this government that knew that would be experiencing a drought but decided to sell off maize that was in stock, that likely putting six million people to starvation. What kind of a reckless government does that? I'll tell you that uh, I think uh, this goes into the realms of how do you do business. We are 20 million people. Our GDP ran down to 20, 20 billion. Right now, I think we've taken it to about 30 billion. You, will not do, you do not, and I hope this argument will also touch on the uh, energy exports. Please. A few yeah. energy exports. <laughs> How do you grow your economy? How do you cater for your people, first and foremost? First and foremost, you need to ensure that you are food secure. And the numbers from Honorable Mutolo are spot on. We need to make sure we are food, food secure in our reserves. We also need to see what our neighbors have. That's number one, number two. I talked about GDP, 20 billion to 30 billion. We need to grow as an economy. We are too small. Our GDP is too small. How are we going to grow our GDP? We're only, only going to grow our GDP by trading with our neighboring countries. But only a reckless we, government sells its food I'm and coming, puts its people I'm, at risk I'm knowing there's a that. drought coming. I'm coming to that. Are you, as Minister of Environment, not advising Honorable Agriculture Minister that we what are, you're doing is dangerous? We are sitting in the same cluster, and we have not done that. Mm. I was just going to explain on the other side. But mm. first of all, mm. to tell you that we are food secure, no Zambian will go hungry. I will repeat, no Zambian will go hang, hungry. I'm not Minister of Agriculture, but I sit in this cluster. Very, very important cluster to ensure that we are food secure. Mm. I'll tell you right now again, and you have to quote me, no Zambian will go hungry. So the, the big question is, why did we sell, then we're now importing? Th that's a big argument. Why should we import when we had enough? We are importing. Should we have a, a deficit? Remember, this is a continuous process. You plan today, you have your, you are food secure, and obviously, there's a food reserve. Remember, there's a food reserve by FRI. There's a food reserve. And what's its purpose, Minister? Its purpose for, is for, to ensure for, for that they, they, the country is food secure, secure right in now. situations like this. And that's why you see ZNS and all the other million companies getting maize from FRI. It's from our stock. That reserve is there. I'll tell you. I'll ask how you a question. How much do I'll we have I'll ask in you reserve? a question mm -hmm. right now. Isn't there a medium everywhere? Which is expensive. That's another realm. 
I may not be very competent to talk about the, mm. the pricing, mm. but I'm talking about the stock. Mm. The stock is there right now. In fact, the stock is reaching my rural population. So as, as mm. the, so you when you would talk about the the, the the export, the import and the export, mm. for me the primary issue here is that we are food secure. So as should you, we as have excess? Mm. We if we have excess in either in the food sector mm. or in the energy sector, it's only prudent that we get a lucrative market. But, and but I'll tell you, let me finish this argument. Yeah. We have not e e exported to a point where our f uh, we have food insecure. I'm encouraging my farmers, and the, 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 I, 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 I hope they're hearing me. With my meteorological data, my climate smart agriculture, I, my aim, sir, is to produce 10 million tons next year. What am I going to do with all that maize? I only need about 3 million tons. I need to export. I want the maize sector to be a sector which is self-financing. It's the reason we've increased the price of maize to 80, so that you, 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 you get money not only for your livelihoods, but for, for, <coughs> for other livelihoods. I, I, I understand where you're going, that uh, agriculture is, is, more, a is, is more a business. Yes, it is uh, a business. And, uh, under the UPND be. administration, but a business at the risk of people going hungry. So if you say you want us to quote you tonight that no Zambian will go hungry and we've got enough stock, you sit in the same cluster as the agriculture minister. Tell us, how much maize are we sitting on in stock? How much are we going to import? And what are we projecting in this dry spell how the crop forecast will look like in this coming season. I may not tell you the numbers mm. because these are moving targets, first mm. of all. I think the Minister of Agriculture will be the most competent because you have all the numbers. If you had asked me before, <coughs> I was going to come with these numbers. However, what I know from where I'm sitting is that no Zambia will go hungry. What I know from the focus. Remember, I've also told you other things we're doing already. In fact, the president he was involved in harvesting of some maize not too long ago, last month or something. In the next two months again, there's another 300,000 metric tons coming on board. You are, you are with me? So for me, to ensure that no Zambian goes hungry, should there be a deficit? That's why I'm talking to my neighboring countries already have secured, mm. or we have secured. Talk, talking to neighboring countries, one of the other predictions, and, I, and I'm sure you've captured that within your department, is that this drought has not only affected Zambia, it's affected heavily mostly the Sadiq region. Yes. So which neighbors are you talking to that are more food secure than we are? Because they are, when you look at, for example, the shared power capacity in energy with Zimbabwe, yes. we are both suffering because even there, Malawi is hit, they had floods recently, Zimbabwe is hit. So where are we going to be getting these maize? You, you mentioned Tanzania. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Zimbabwe is the food, is, is, they've declared a disaster emergency to Malawi. Uh, they have. D DRC. But, and but by the way, mm -hmm. even if they hadn't declared a disaster, we export to these countries. We are the most food secure in the region. We export to a DRC, we export to Malawi, we export to Mozambique. In fact, last year, the East African region was food insecure. Tanzania, Uganda, they were food insecure. Okay? Now, why am I saying we've secured? We are being methodical. We are trying to do th preventive measures. We've already talked to Tanzania. Tanzania is food secure right now. That niche, there will be a lot of pressure from all these other countries to get that food. That's the reason why we've secured um, a source from there. Further, Costa, if you transition from the food sector to the energy sector, you also ask me why do we export? export, so, 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 import? So, so still on the, on, the, on, the, on the maze, before we come to energy, does it make sense then that if we had enough stock, we should have been able uh, to keep enough? And, and what I know is that our, our consumption, both for food purposes, both for feed, whether it's, 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 it's transforming the maize mill into, into uh, uh, the malt for, for alcohol, I think not over 3 million metric tons as a country. So if we knew that this is our capacity, why then would we sell so much that again we begin to import? We should only be selling the excess. Do you, do you know and, why? and we should remain with the 3 million that we need. But we sold beyond the 3 million. Do you know why, why, why we're having a deficit? Mm. Because of crop failure. Here is a stock for this period of time. And this stock will be replenished by this season. 
and this season is bad very very bad what do you do do we not stock is any it? do we not stock any excess maybe say 1 to 1.5 million in in the case of this because that's even, why we even, are not even, studying even, right now that's even, why, even that's before the UPND we were told so many stories of bumper harvest after bumper harvest what happened to things like the grain storage and the NAM board and, and, and all those things have you completely done away with those things no we haven't done away with th these things mm -hmm. it's a reason why you are seeing maize in the country we haven't imported yet. We are being cautious. And we are being cautious for the same reasons you're expounding right now. We are being cautious because should there be a deficit, there's no other place to get the maize from. So we are already securing stock in Tanzania. But we are not sitting there. Through these pronouncements by President Haka in the water harvesting, remember he encouraged the, uh, the defense forces, and I want to say it here, that if in the time of peace, and we want to maintain peace every time, what should they be doing? They should be, the defense forces should be involved in productivity, production. Yeah. And they've done very, very well. ZNS, uh, the army, correctional services, they're on board. They've not only grown maize to ensure that we have enough maize in the country. They've gone further. They're milling that maize so that we ensure that our people are food secure. I think he, by and large, Costa, this government has done a lot. It would have been worse. And this government has done a lot under very difficult circumstances. How would we then coincide the fact that it's doing a lot? Because the starting point really is, first of all, there's, there's a Ministry of Green Economy and Environment, granted. But when you look at the percentage allocated to your ministry in terms of budget, Surely, Minister, there's nothing you can do amidst all these huge and grave global conditions. Your budget allocation in the, in the whole you know, scheme of things is less than 3%, Minister. So surely, uh, uh, is this UPND administration serious about the problems of climate change? How does your ministry work with such minimal resources? I will agree with you. The money we receive as a ministry is not enough. I would agree with you. And this is public information. However... The literary source we have, remember... So that clearly means that we're not serious in fighting climate change. Not, not at all. Not at all. Even in the midst of um, literary sources, you have to be innovative. It's the reason why you see... And by the way, maybe to make it more clear, I'll tell you what a green economy is. Low carbon <coughs> investments, resource efficiency, social inclusivity. These three pillars really are mainstreams, should be mainstreams in all sectors. Right now we're discussing the agriculture sector. What, a, what is the Ministry of Green Economy doing? It's ensuring it supports climate smart agriculture. One very big thing, it supports the livestock sector. We are looking at energy. How do we transition, obviously? We are mainly hydropower based, so it's clean energy, 90%. But we need to ensure that there's a good energy mix there, solar, wind. What else are we doing? We need to ensure, obviously, in all the other sectors that these three principles are mainstreamed. We have projects in all the other areas, obviously, to ensure that uh, mitigation measures adapt, to ensure that uh, there's uh, adaptation, to ensure that we build resilience. So in all sectors, including the health sector, by the way, in all sectors, we have to ensure that we grow these sectors in a climate-smart way. Now, what are we not doing well? As you said you already, it's a budget. Now, we are coming from very, very difficult times. Dead distress, very little funding. We need in this period, obviously, to support the social sector. And the social sector has been up. Let me just make one point mm -hmm. here. Social sector has been improved. Now, having uh, restructured our debt, I think we're moving very, very well in this end. Having uh, cleared the other elephant in the room, the mines, the mines should start working. I believe, and I'm t going to tell you that, you will see an increased budgetary allocation to the environment sector. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say that uh, government is a continuous process, regardless of the party in power. And the low budget allocation to environment ministry uh, is, has not started only with the UPND. I've, I've been looking at these budgets and covering them. And clearly, it's, it's, it's a big Zambian problem. It's a big African problem because even when we sit on the global stage, it's like, Minister, 
we conduct our climate and environment affairs more or less like dependent, it's, it's a donor agenda. We ourselves are not very serious because even when I talk 3%, we've seen budget allocations as little as 1%. So if we look the last 10 years, 20 years when we knew about this problem, have we really been serious as a people? We, I, as I said, we are doing a few things off the budget, but I will agree with you 100%. In fact, we have even put it much higher. Costa is not 3%, mm. it's about 0.8%. <laughs> so we need to improve. I mean, these are public documents, so we are not doing very well as far as allocating a good percentage of the budget to the environment. Mm. Wake up calls, we have a severe drought. Wake up calls, we are food insecure. Wake up call, we are energy insecure. Wake up call, we are water insecure. If you go in the villages, just these boreholes we drill, uh, Costa. It's a sad story. Mm. We used to drill boreholes at 40, 50 meters easily and find water. Now we have to go to 100 mm. meters. So there is a realization yeah. in government, in this particular government. If there's a realization. That, uh, a better budget allocation must be. If there's a realization, you touch something very important, water harvesting. You're an engineer. Is it a problem that the last 60 years, we celebrate 60 years of independence this year, don't we have the skilled manpower, the, 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 the technology, the innovation? Because I've heard stories and national development plans of how we sit on 60% of the water aquifer within the SADC region. Yet now, load shedding has become a normal thing because on the northern half, it's flooding. On the southern part, it's a drought. Why do we have ideas only on paper but fail to practically implement? Again, you are correct, completely right. I'm a fellow of the Engineering Institution of Zambia. I'm a water engineer, I'm a civil engineer, a hydropower engineer. It's sad. If you look at the region again, 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 you are right, where we have most of the water. Most of the Zambezi River is in Zambia. The Kapura is entirely here. The water bodies, the big lakes. We are not dammed, Costa. Mm. If you look at on the Zimbabwean side, and when you look at the meteorological data, compare Zambia and Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe is much, much drier. But I'll tell you, there are so many more dams in Zimbabwe than in Zambia. So most of the water goes into Zimbabwe and is dammed. It's the reason why, uh, Water harvesting is on President Hakainde's lips all the time. It's only on his lips. It's 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 not practical. It's to being practical right now. You, 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 you right now. Us, Minister, you've shown us, you've taken us the media yes. into farms with yes. the army, with yes. the national service, yes. with the air force. Yes. That we've seen. Yes. I've seen a dam right here in Chisamba, the yes. Mwamboshi Dam. Yes. I've never seen it in Northern Province where you're damming water. I'm, I've not seen any water harvesting project. Again, that's wrong because you are already saying there's so much water in the northern. I don't need to dam there. I just need to get it into the field. Where I need to dam is on the lo south side where there's more productivity, particularly in the bays. Where, where are these when, dams? Where are they in the budget? I, 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 I don't see even the Ministry of Finance allocating any monies towards this water course, harvesting I've project. I've constructed the dam in my constituency right now through mm. CDF mm. here. It's 320 but, but meters. That's within your CDF budget. It, it, that's the same money. But, 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 but money. Wait, I'm coming mm. to that. I've done it. It's practical. And mm. it's practical to do it. Mm. I did it this year. Mm. 300, 320 meters by 6 meters mm -hmm. is going to hold in excess of 1.5 million cubic meters. Right now, my livestock is, 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 is getting water from there. Soon, I'll also be doing winter maize in my area. But, but now, actually we're me, expecting a, me big, a bigger dam than that one. Something at the national level. Wait. Mm. The ministry, and you, obviously I wish the Minister of Water and the Development Owner Bomposha would come to answer for himself. But again, I'm also in that cluster mm. because climate change affects water availability so much. There are dams which have been constructed under our guard. There are dams planned to be constructed. So many of the dams, actually, I think it's next week or the other week, we'll be visiting these dams. This is on the government side. On the private sector side, particularly the commercial farmers in Mukushi, who just cleared two dams to be constructed right now. What have we done? In fact, maybe also this is very interesting for you. As a ministry, through Zema, remember Zema was in those days a hindrance to uh, these projects coming on stream quickly. We've changed the EMA Act. And one of the things which is in there is to ensure that the fees are lowered. 
the statutory periods in which I would give decisions now have been reduced. We are also doing what is called a, a, a strategic impact assessments. I go in an area and say, okay, maybe this area, this is the way this area should develop. So there we look at the potential for agriculture, the potential for energy, for potential for domestic supply. So we come together and say, this site, let's develop it. That's why now it links in to what we're talking about uh, with the Minister of Agriculture, 100,000 hectares per province, so 1 million hectares. How do we do all of these things together? What do they need? Is, the farm is, needs water, is, it needs energy, is, is, it needs infrastructure. Is there a blueprint and an environmental impact assessment or feasibility studies done in terms of dams or a, a, a dam that will cushion the impact of both our energy and agricultural supply? A project to the magnitude, for example, of we saw the, the, the battle between Egypt and Ethiopia, who share the Nile River. Ethiopia minister, you should be aware now, after they dammed water, they are probably one of the countries in Africa that have become quite energy secure and are beginning to export. Anything of that nature on, 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 on our cards? Yes, there is. With Look, figures and, 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 and EIA done and, and, and a blueprint laid down? We, serious discussion right now with the DRC on Luapula. Actually, the minister is uh, forming what is called the Luapula river authority okay potential there we believe that uh, that area must be developed strategic shift also to ensure that we are, we are food and energy secure there's a lot of water up north there for energy for what uh, for energy and for um, irrigation so in that area the ministry of water and the uh, sanitation in Porsche is very very busy there i mean i'm a member of his uh, technical ministerial group there so we are doing that. In, we are also looking at uh, the other rivers around uh, uh, in the southern province, in the in the eastern province, in the eastern province, because the eastern province produces a lot of maize as well. In um, in the central province, in Lusaka province. So there's a blueprint, yes, and it will be very very interesting to showcase this blueprint. Mm. When will that be done? Have the feasibility studies been done? Do we know the cost? Are we putting resources aside at cabinet level? Are we in, in tune on when we're going to begin to roll this out next year? Pre uh, President Haka and I appointed a, a special cabinet committee to look into that. And I will tell you that very soon, I think Porsche will be coming to your studio mm. to inform the Zambians what we are doing in this sector. But we are not just waiting for that report. We're engaged in the private sector. I think by next month or the other month, there's another dam coming up in Mukushi and in the Serenji area, commercial farmers. So we're also encouraging the private sector. We want to partner with them. We've done our part as government, regulations, fees, mm -hmm. to partner with them because we believe that the private sector also must participate. So we also mm -hmm. want to ensure, remember the two, in the main sector particularly, the 10 million tons target. That basically tells you that we want to export. So in short, Minister, you're saying that your water harvesting plans uh, or, or programs will in the short term see us not having any floods. If we have too much rain, we should be able to harvest this water. You've touched the Based, on the, based on the data available. Obviously, if, uh, 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 dams are for storage, dams are fl for flood control dams for us we're also looking at upstream etagetage as you know upstream cafe hook halfway hook bridge is the last uh, station meteorological uh, hydrological station on the thing upstream for us we are saying how do we harvest the water upstream so that that can contribute to the flows downstream into the reservoir into etagetage power station into cafe upper into cafe lower also, we are also looking at uh, the cont rivers contributing to the Zambezi River. We are also looking up north, as I said. So that blueprint, whilst the complete blueprint is being worked on, there are also low-hanging fruits, low-hanging fruits in several areas. And this year in particular, again, I'll go on a helicopter, as you saw me, to commission construction with some of them to commission to commission the dams themselves, like we've commissioned the dam in the Nangoma. Mm. 
Let's let's talk about energy. You 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 began to bite uh, on that aspect. Uh, Zesco just earlier this afternoon announced that they're reverting back to the uh, eight-hour load shedding, you know, plan. There's been a debate. Uh, really about uh, whether this drought is the most severe that the country's history has based on available records and whether it's true or not that Zesco is telling the truth. Um, you hinted that you wanted to demonstrate what your data was unveiling. Run us through uh, the, 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 the records and, and what history is telling us in terms of the rainfall patterns, what we've received, and what we're currently going through. That would be a very good opportunity. I hope my graph will be there. Mm. I wanted to show this if, this data, mm. obviously, to ensure that he, mm. us all Zambians <laughs> are in sync. I don't know whether they can put it down a bit, first of all. Okay. If we can just go down. Uh, put it, put it, okay. So when you see this curve, this is what's called a hydrograph. Mm. Okay. On, on the axis there there's discharge mm. this side is a period this is a period so it's october to september this is like a hydrological year mm. the lowest there then it starts rising so this is flows now so in november for example it's about uh, 200 and what is this one this is the uh, 1994 19, 95 95 96 2023 20, so we are here this on is the green on the green here yeah. so normally um, because this, uh, these hydrographs are as a result of data collection. So you, you measure flows on the river every year, every day, and then you get a monthly flow. You, you, you get a, an average for the month, and then you plot it. So it will be rising because you are in an active period of the rains. So, the so, rains so will be in 2023-2024, from, from, from October, the yes. discharge, this is in cubic centimeters, yes. I believe. Yes. So we were rising all the way up until, until highest mid-February? Mid about mid-February. Mm. When you look Into about 800 cubic centimeters? Exactly. Mm. Cubic, cubic meters per second. Mm. So when you look at this period, which was a very difficult period, You've seen this period. The highest was in 95? Look, look at the peak. In 94, 95. Look at the peak. To over 1,200. Exactly. Mm. We are here, and we are going down. So obviously, when you look at the curve, it may have one small peak and going down, but you'll never reach here. You understand? Mm. So this will tell you, because the area under this curve... But one can argue that when you look at the red, 95, 96 probably could have been the worst, though it had a peak. That's what we are saying. Mm. We are going towards, we are still in an active season, we are going towards a very, very difficult time. Because at a time when we are supposed to be going up, we are going down. Remember, this is an inflow into the Itajitaji Reserve. And in that Itajitaji Reserve, we are generating power. Mm. So this is an inflow and an outflow. This is the time when we are going to be going up, but we are going down. So we'll go down faster so, because so, there isn't enough. So, 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 so in, in, in short, these graphs are interpreting that somewhere between February and end of May is our peak discharge period. Exactly. So this is when so, now so what is all the, data the small rivers mm. discharge into the Kafue. And this water now is measured at a station called Kafue Hook Bridge, mm -hmm. just before the reservoir. So it measures how much in total quantity, in cubic meters, you are going to receive in that reserve. And that is how now Zesco comes in and says, I have so much water, I have so much energy. And this energy, remember, is only in one year, in this period. How am I going to distribute it mm. until the next rain season? So when they do that simulation, they do that simulation, then they will know, am I going to generate 200 megawatts, 300 megawatts? If I do 300 megawatts, I may deplete my reservoir and they will not have any water in November and December. Mm. So uh, that is that those hours of load shedding are equivalent to the generation. Mm. So, so, so based, I, I know that we're in April uh, right now, so this, this data obviously is cumulative, you, you continue getting, but what is the forecast telling you uh, in terms of what we should be expecting by the time we're getting to go down in May, June, what does it look like? Can you say that we should be expectant of an increased load shedding or maybe a, a reduced? I think to answer that question better, maybe let's him. Oh, yeah, this is a Zambezi mm, this is, river monthly flow. Okay, mm. this is a Zambezi river monthly flow. Again, here to clearly show you, for particularly on the Zambezi, on the Kafiwe, 
we are not yet, uh, we are quite bad, mm. but not as bad as on the Zambezi system. So when you look at the, the green again, in fact, this is a Zambezi system. So this we is want a green, to yeah, this is a green. No, no, no. Uh, let's go. Uh, uh, so when you when you look at it, the, the peak is about April. Mm. We are already going down. Mm. The amount, the volume of water we've received at Big Force, you know, we measure these flows at Big Force or in Levy. For the Zambezi. For the Zambezi. Mm. It's so low. I think uh, the, if I remember my figures, uh, if I remember my figures correctly, we, in the waste time, we only received about 8 billion cubic meters. Now we are about 17, 16, 17, and we may not surpass, in fact, we will not surpass the lowest we've ever received. Remember, <coughs> the um, Kariba, mm. the head on Kariba is very small, so the usage of water for generation of that power is very, very high. So when you look at it, again, again, I'll tell you, I don't know whether the information is there. There was Do also- you want us to scroll down? Yes, scroll down. <laughs> Director, if we can just scroll up, is it, is it this one? No, 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 go down. I think it's good, down. But, but I know the if, if we can go If we can go down again, a direct here. Yeah. If we can go down, yeah, that, that, no down? No, 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 if you can go, yeah, like that. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe it's okay. So this data, Costa, mm. the measurement started in 1907. Mm. So this data is more than 100 years. I think there was also an argument by us politicians. You know, politicians, we just throw in things. You're not experts what is, uh, sometimes. Yeah, what is the uh, president talking about? But the president was spot on. The president is advised. The president was spot on. This data is more than 100 years. And in this 100 years, on this system, this is the worst we are ever going to receive. So the situation is mm. now. If this the is so, so, if the data is telling us that this is the worst we were going to receive yes. in a hundred years, exactly. It comes back to my question: Then, what were we doing as a methodical government in mitigation, preparation for mitigation? I thought I'll tell you one of the things. Mm. How would you mitigate? First of all, a drought. Mm. What we are doing now is to ensure that there's load management. Are these the figures you were looking for? Yes, but uh, yeah. So what you are doing basically mm -hmm. is load management. It's a necessary evil right now. But one that disrupts production and puts expenses on small businesses. It, Huge it, cost. It's the reason why when you do load management, obviously most power, and that's what we're encouraging ESCO, must go to the productive sector. We still need to grow our economy. We are in a difficult situation. Another thing we're trying to do is obviously for the power we have, how do we increase efficiency, for example, the switch on, switch off. How do we win off those of you like Costa from the grid? You need to buy a solar unit yourself. You need to be on if LPG. I can afford. You can afford. So some of the <laughs> same, some bracket should be off, mm. okay? Sh sh should really be off. What should we do? There's a reason why also, remember, uh, Costa, when you look at the deficit of eight hours, maybe going to 10 hours, it's a difficult time. Mm. Minister, I, I had a... ZESCO is trying as much as possible as well to import from our neighboring countries. But our neighboring countries, as we've stated here, they're also hydropower-based, mm. and the region is... Energy uh, uh, there's a deficit in the energy... Mm. I managed to have an opportunity to speak to uh, MD uh, Victor Mapani on yeah. this platform. He explained very clearly that uh, our current hydro capacity, all things being equal, is sitting at about 3,600 megawatts. All things being equal, that the water discharge and everything is good. Um, currently, we, we have a, a demand of about 2,300. So we, all, all things being equal, then we have surpassed demand. But as we sit right now, we're at about 750 megawatts deficit. My query now, and, and because you sit in that cluster of, 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 of ministers and government, that's on the hydropower side. How much incentive and how much effort is being made in the energy mix? I'm talking about solar, I'm talking about coal, and probably nuclear energy. Are, are we doing enough quickly to cushion this 750 to 1,000 megawatts? And, I, and, and I first and foremost, I want to support what Victor Mapani is saying, chief executive of ZESCO. He's correct, 100%. All things being equal right now. We shouldn't have any hour of load shedding at all. Now, what have we done? Again, if you see our policy statements, 
on the energy sector so much. We want to be energy uh, sufficient. <coughs> we want to be energy surplus because obviously that offers us an opportunity for for exports. What is, what we are grappling with now is that we do not have a good energy mix. Hit by a drought, we are thrown off overboard, and that's why again you see our efforts in bringing more renewable solar. Again, we're doing a lot. Just last week, I accompanied the president to CEC, CEC, to commission, yes, in Tipa, to commission, that is a 60 megawatt plant. We will set, give, uh, come up with favorable conditions for companies in Zambia, and particular CEC, we are very proud of them, who issued the, you remember, they issued the green, green board. board. So there's, it means that the sector is becoming more and more attractive, and players like CEC and others must be supported. Already conditions very ripe for that private sector participation in the energy sector. We are also encouraging Mamba. Mamba, there's only 300 megawatts. Remember, hard as this may sound, we need to develop as a country. We have a natural resource called coal, and I'm in the Minister of Green Economy and Environment. I need that that clean energy, clean... The global, we'll call it clean, dirty energy. Clean energy. Is it a also depends on the, mm -hmm. the technology we're using. But more so, we believe that our carbon sink capacity is so big that will not contribute that much to global warming. So if, I'm getting, if, if I'm getting you right... Small if I'm getting you right, very, Minister, very small you just came out of COP28. You know, what is Zambia's policy stance? Because I know that uh, out of the Kyoto uh, Protocol, there was commitments by, especially the global industrialized countries, the U.S., China, India, and them, that carbon emissions should be reduced by the year 2030. Some are pushing 2050, 2080 now. I just saw Germany. I was reading they've uh, put on stream a new coal-fired plant. Australia, one of the biggest coal mines, is saying they still want to mine China itself. What is our position? Are we being told by the West that we should completely go green and clean while we are sitting on excess coal? We are a sovereign state. Mm. Our interests come first, first and foremost. But we are also a country which plays its significant role in the global world. We believe that reducing emissions is the right way to go. We believe that we need to show leadership ourselves as well. But it's good for us. We are experiencing climate change. We have a drought now. <coughs> Is it good to increase on your emissions? No, it's not. For us, we believe that the in, when you look at the summations, our contribution is very low, almost negligible. Yeah. Our capacity to increase the energy mix is very, very big. So we are looking at solar, and obviously we only have 300 megawatts. And when you do our measurements, they're, they're so low. So we we'll we'll have a case justified with empirical data that we're not going to worsen the situation. Mm. So we will still play within the rules of the global world. Mm. Part, of the balance, part of the balance, Minister, is, correct me if I'm wrong, what you call your carbon bonds or, or, or carbon mitigation measures. So if, if we increase on our coal plants or emission, the aspect of how we cushion that with you know, planting trees and, and, and so on. And I've seen projects where in certain uh, chief domes in the eastern province and elsewhere, uh, global uh, initiatives where villagers are paid for planting a tree to plow back into, green, into the green economy. How, how are we working towards such initiatives? We're doing a lot. First of all, we need to ensure that we have the necessary uh, policy and legal framework. Mm. So right now, I'm very busy. I'll be introducing the climate change bill in Parliament. Mm. So what we have now are regulations and an SI which may not be adequate themselves for us to play effectively in the market. However, with those regulations, we are already, we've already encouraged a lot of companies to start investing. Remember, it's an investment first. For you to establish that sink, you need another five, another 10 years, okay? So in that period, you need to invest. So in that period, you do all kinds of activities, the project, it's called the project itself. And that project obviously involves the local communities. The local communities have to be put on board because, first of all, they're the ones who utilize that energy resource. But more so, you need to offer alternative livelihoods to them for them to stop what they're doing. So soon, I think I should be able to come back to you because it's a long topic mm. so that we unravel it for the benefit of the Zambians. Mm. We're experiencing, you know, this drought. Obviously, the energy deficit comes in 
it also sparks a problem directly for your ministry because then the uptake for charcoal and cutting down trees, which is more of a problem again towards uh, deforestation, huge problem. H how are we striking a balancing act because now charcoal demand is high? It's a big problem and it's a problem I acknowledge, I've been acknowledging that it's very, very big. Let's talk on the legal side. The law is very, very clear. You don't do any charcoal burning, cutting down a tree and uh, and producing charcoal without a permit from me. It's illegal. So first of all, I'm going to enforce the law because I'm looking at it this way, Costa. What's the alternative? Is charcoal burning the solution to this power deficit right now? If these increased levels of charcoal burning are left unchecked, what day are we going to experience in the next Ms. Minister uh, or MP coming from Nangoma, a rural constituency, charcoal burning or firewood is not even an alternative. It's the way of life. We are talking about commercial production. Mm. Most of these trucks <laughs> coming through to Lusaka, to the, to the, mm. to the capital. But, but even in Lusaka, in most densely populated areas, gas cooking or solar usage or, or, or diesel power generators, it's not the in thing. The, the, the uptake for charcoal, even the, the, the price of a 25 kg bag has gone up due to increased demand. We need to find alternative sources. And the alternative sources, obviously, are off-grid solar solutions, the LPG and others. My argument is, yes, indeed, this is easily available. This place is easily manufactured. This is available to our people. But is that the right thing to do? I think that question really is what should be asked. I don't think it's the right thing to do. We really need to find an alternative to charcoal burning. If we allow charcoal burning, it will be a disaster. Uh, Just look at Southern Province. Mm. Southern Province was a breadbasket of this country. We went down there, cut all the trees. The climate, the weather has changed there. They no longer receive as much rainfall as they used to. The rivers, the streams, everything has dried up there. Productivity is so low. That actually now there's a shift of our people from the south to the north. But, but if we continue, but, but, but if we allow ministry, them to do what they did in the mm, south, mm, what can type of ministry, country are we going to have? Uh, 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 what about long-term mitigation measures going through schools and so on? When I was growing up, we had things like Chongololo Club and things like that, being encouraged to grow trees. We don't see these government initiatives. We only see you participating, Minister, from private sector-led initiatives, whether it's the banks trying to plant a million trees what about you as a government, you as a ministry? We're doing a lot. Mm. and one of Which them we don't see? In fact, here right in this studio, I've been here a lot of times uh, with my good friend Mwasa. Mm. No, the other Mwasa now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Discussing these issues. Mm. That's what we have to do. We have a, a communication and advocate strategy to ensure that we speak to these things. We are planting trees ourselves through the forest department. We're ensuring that the policy direction is the right one. But I need the private sector. You yourself just bemoan how much money I receive. I receive very little money. You say 3%, I corrected you, and said you have 0.8%. So if I receive some little money, where do I look? I need to look at the private sector. And they are doing a lot. Banks, ABSA, Zanaco, and other banks, they are doing a lot. They are planting trees. I'm also encouraging a lot of corporates to go green. I think he, he last year or the other year I was at the... Uh, uh, the building for Stan Chattered mm -hmm. Bank, we're looking at waste, plastic, and all these things. It's not only the ministry. Remember, this economy is by and large also la run by the private sector. What is uh, Diamond TV doing? I'm seeing a lot of bottles around. You. How, are, <laughs> how are you going green here? That's what I'm doing. Why are you going green as Diamond mm -hmm. TV? So it's all of us together. Mm. Talking about bottles and all those things going green, uh, waste management, uh, uh, another issue is, is, is part of your ministry's policy and mandate. Um, electronic waste in a digital and computer edge is a big nightmare. When, when cell phones with, with batteries and all these gadgets, do we have a policy in terms of disposal or even dump sites for electronic waste? I know there's, there's a current law, be it an SI on issues of plastic, but it has never been enforced. We're still trading in non-biodegradable products as a country, which again is a drawback towards what you're trying to achieve. Plastic pollution is a big problem for the environment. Very, very big problem. It chokes 
the drainage systems. <laughs> I'll tell you one of the reasons why we had cholera so severe in Kanyama, it's basically drainage. The drainage was clogged, the drainage is not adequate, so there's a lot of ponding there. And remember there are shallow wells there, yeah. there are shallow pit latrines there. So the water was mixing with fecal <coughs> matter. That's why we're ensuring that, first of all, obviously, we may have to relocate some people there, put in the necessary infrastructure, ensure we improve the drainage system. However, we also need to sensitize our people. <coughs> this culture of ours is not very good. Everybody must be responsible for their debt, Costa. Debt. You can't throw away a plastic bottle hoping that there's somebody waiting to catch it and put it in the right thing. We need to change our mindset. That's very, very important. And what's coming up now is obviously tougher laws to ensure that we ban plastic. If I had my way today, I would ban plastic tomorrow. But we are on that journey because the cost of plastic pollution is way too high. Recycling and factories, you still haven't answered me on electronic waste because it's a huge Do we have law or SIs around el electronic waste? Indeed. Right? You remember there's a, a solid waste yeah. sitting under the Ministry of Local Government. So us and local government actually are coming up with even more stricter laws and conditions to tackle this challenge. You've seen the dump sites. And by the way, dump sites um, have a more potent gas called methane than the CO2, which causes climate change. So we need to see how we manage that. And I can tell you that, again, I'll be coming to the studio to ro roll out how we think this should be going. And you're almost there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in the previous administration, mm -hmm. uh, I remember hosting the minister then of local government, Vincent Mwale, who spoke about measures around recycling and how this business was growing, empowering women in Osaka to pick up all these plastic bottles, take them to the factories, um, as well as turning garbage into cash at the Chunga Dab site. Have you thrown away those plans as a government? If you've continued on them, where are we? Not at all. Mm. Actually, it's part of the extended producer responsibility, that law. We're also encouraging private sector. Remember, it's a business. Uh, the last time I checked, I think the numbers were not very good for this business. So we need to see what incentives we put into the business for it to grow on itself, because it's a big industry. Indeed, waste to energy should be encouraged. It's being done on a small level, but it's, it has to be increased. So it's basically government coming in and uh, providing those incentives. I think we'll be there very soon as well. Finally, Minister, I mean, uh, we, we're gearing up for COP, you know, 29 again, and all these things that uh, involve climate change. Talk about a future that is, you know, green like your ministry and, and an efficient usage. Of, of energy, but one of the biggest global agendas is the, the shift from diesel, petrol-generated vehicles into EV, electronic vehicles. We're sitting pretty as a country. Uh, with Congo, I've seen memoranda being signed in the production or in the raw material to manufacture batteries for these electronic vehicles. So we're, we're talking about a, a new green economy, like your ministry, but a new green order in terms of how the world and transport will run. How is your ministry positioning itself? What, what, what role or contribution are you making in the scheme of this transformation? We have green minerals here. And uh, again, our pronouncements this is a government, not just as a minister of green economy, because we work with the other lead sectors, like the mining <coughs> sector, for example. First of all, I think he, you realize that he, for us to, pro, uh, to attract private sector participation, the conditions have to be right. Mm -hmm. And the elephant on the room basically was a debt situation. We needed to ensure that we manage the debt as quickly as possible. We needed to ensure that the other conditions, security, um, good governance, fight against corruption, all of these ingredients must be tackled. I think now we're investment ready. We've talked to DRC, we've talked to the Americans, we've talked to the Chinese, we've talked to the EU, we've talked to everybody. We are at a point where everybody understands our vision, and that our vision is not only to, ex to extract that mineral, but to value add on that mineral. We have already created a zone in, the, in, the, in dollar now, I think it's in dollar, where we're going to do the processing. You've seen us going through trying to ensure that uh, Zambia becomes... Uh, 
the transport board of, for the region. You've seen us going, um, talking to various players out there. I'm tying this now to COP and my, the president's travels. I've been traveling a lot with the president. Have you seen the results now? Our trips to America, our trips to Dubai, our trips which have culminated into the copper mines now running and beginning to run and run quickly. Our goal for three million tons per annum in the next decade. Surely I'm seeing, I'm, 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 you are seeing that we are, we are going towards that direction. So we're trying to create all these conditions to ensure that we run our country better, that we grow our GDP. And I'm very glad that uh, the numbers are beginning to show as that we are growing and growing very steadily. Our growth rate has moved from minus 2.8 percent, I think, to now 3 to 4 percent. Our GDP has grown from a mere 20 billion, where it was plunged, to now about 30 billion. Our social s uh, protection measures have been increased. I think so far so good. The only thing we can do now is to rally our population, our Zambians. Let's support each other. Let's work hard. TikTok, TikTok will not take us anywhere. Let's be one people. Let's love one another. There can only be one government at a time. And the government which is there now is a UPND government. Let's support each other until 2026. Minister of Green Economy and Environment, Engineer Honorable Colin Zimzovo, thank you so much for talking to me this evening. Always a pleasure. I hope you'll be, you call me again soon. Thank you, Costa. Thanks. We've been having a discussion around climate change and climate smart issues. Obviously, the drought affecting the country, causing a potential food and energy insufficiency. My guest has been the Minister of Green Economy and Environment. Remember to catch this episode on our Facebook thread. It's Diamond TV Zambia. Also on our YouTube, Diamond TV Zambia. Good night and God bless. Costa was brought to you by FQM Trident Limited, a subsidiary.